in that seven dollar a month place used to be it was my it was who I was I was no one I was in the sewer my mom went there I had nothing and you always feel like you have nothing I had achieved so much I was a Navy SEAL I've gone through Ranger School I've gone through Delta Force selection training I I, I done so much. I, I run 200 miles, pull up records, everything. Learned to read and write, became pretty intelligent. And I still was like, man, what is wrong with me? It wasn't until I got real sick, and I talked about in the last chapter of that book. I got real sick, and I was about um, 38 years old. I'm 43 now, and my life got real quiet. I went from running 205 miles in 39 hours to I couldn't get out of bed. The doctors couldn't figure out what was wrong with me, but once again, it was the best thing that ever happened to me. In that moment when my whole <clears throat> life changed, I went from a guy who worked out every day, trained every day, to a guy who couldn't get out of bed. My life was taken from me. The one thing that kept me going was my training. I didn't have anything, and that's, that's what changed me. And wow. that's when I realized, I hadn't thought, hadn't taken time to think about what I'd done in my life. I hadn't reflected. I'd done all these things, but there was no finish line. I still believe that, but you must have time to reflect. Yeah. I was just going. I wouldn't even, I finished the race of life, and I wouldn't even receive my medal. I'd go on. <laughs> i get in the car and i go. Gone. Don't care about like, it. I'm not, Most people sit soft. around, and that's what they like. <laughs> They, they need the ceremony if I accomplish something. Validity. I haven't done anything. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. I'm just getting started. I was right. When I started figuring out life, that I was leaving so much in the tank, I call it my 40% rule. Yeah. I was leaving so much in the tank. Once I realized, my God, man, I was this dumb, fat kid being bullied, and now I'm a 180-pound person, lost 106 pounds in less than three months. Learn to read, learn to do this, learn to do that. I was like, I need more. I was fueling my mind with everything. And I never took time to say, my God, you came from this hell and you're here. So those insecurities, and this is how I explain it the best way. SEAL training became pretty hard and a lot of guys weren't getting through it. So they designed a SEAL pep prep program. Mm, like a boot camp for the boot camp. That's right. Yeah. And it was two months. In my last two years before I retired <clears throat> from the military, they sent me there to train these kids. To get ready for 18, buds. 19, yeah. 20 years, yeah. young kids. So when they get to Navy SEAL training, man, they were physical studs. They were running, swimming. I mean, they were they were hybrids. Wow. But they get to buds, and the same amount of people would quit. This is why. We were training bigger, stronger, faster quitters. It's not about not the mind. That's right. We weren't diving into the sewer. Everybody's got a story. We don't share it on social media. We share our nice life on social media. We, have, we all have a dungeon. I'm just willing to talk about mine. Most of us aren't willing to talk about it. I'm going to talk about my dungeon. I wasn't getting into the dungeon of these guys' minds. I wasn't building that so-called mental toughness. Mental toughness isn't something that you sample. It's something that you live in every day. So when something hard would happen to these kids, like in Hell Week, it would draw on something that made them very insecure, and they look for comfort. Whenever hardness comes, and you don't know what it is, it may be different for you than it is mm -hmm. for me, but you go back to your insecurities. And then when you go back to your insecurities, you then look for comfort within those insecurities. And we all look for that cookie that your mom used to give you when you were sad, yeah. when you were sick. We look for our wife or our husband. We look for comfort. It's in those moments you must retrain your mind to think differently in hell. I wasn't training them to do that. I wasn't training myself to do that because at that time, I was doing what I was told. These guys need to meet a standard, a physical standard. The physical standard is not what they need to meet. It's a mental standard you must meet in life. So going back to when I was sick, I was hitting the physical standards. I wasn't meeting the mental standard. The mental standard is you must know how far you've come. I wasn't, I, I had come 
8,000 miles from where I started. But if you never know that, you're still in the $7 in the a month place. When I was sick, I was able to slow it down and reflect back on my entire life. And in that bed, when I thought I was dying, because that story is long, that, that sick portion of my life is long, I didn't care if I died or lived. Because wow. I was, for the first time in my life, happy wow. and at peace. Because <clears throat> I reflected back on where I started. And no one saved me. It wasn't like someone came down here and guided me through life. When you figure this out on your own, the amount of pride and dignity and self-respect you have, that's why I walk around the streets with a backpack <laughs> and just like, I don't need anything else. You figure it out by going inside yourself, by callousing over the victim's mentality. You're always a victim, even if you have everything in life, until you realize what you've achieved. And the problem with the collectivist perspective, especially the one that portrays you as a victim, is that it's always up to someone else to solve your problems. It's not like you don't have the problems. You know, the idea that in some sense you're an eternal victim. Well, there's a truth in that, given that nature is conspiring to destroy you and will be successful in the end, that you're undermined by your own society at the same time you're buttressed by it, and that you're a, a target of your own malevolence and that of others. I mean, so there's plenty, there's, there's a triad of tragic and malevolent forces that are aimed directly at your heart, and that's always the case. But, but to not take responsibility for that and to attribute, attribute to that to, to a cosmic injustice or a soci sociological injustice in some sense that's aimed particularly at you, that's somehow the fault of others, is to miss the great adventure of your life. You know, one of the things I learned last year, I was doing a series of biblical lectures, and I started to analyze the Abrahamic stories, which I didn't know very well. And the Abra story of Abraham is particularly interesting because Abraham is, he's a slow starter. He's one of those guys that failed to launch, right? He's, he's in his father's tent, hanging around his mother's skirts till he's 80. And... 80, that's exactly it. And God finally gets fed up with him and says, look, why don't you get the hell out of the tent and get out there in the world and have an adventure? You know, your, your life is waiting for you. And, well, it's God calling, so Abraham has enough sense to pack up and leave. But it's complete bloody catastrophe from there on in, you know. I mean, the first thing he encounters is a famine, and that's no joke. And then it's a tyranny, that's the next thing. And then it's a conspiracy to steal his wife. And I'm sure that he spent the next 20 years wondering why in the world he ever listened to God and just didn't stay in his damn tent. You know, but there's, and, and, and the whole, the Abrahamic story and the stories that, that follow that, are, they all have that same narrative structure is that there's this call to adventure, but it's not to happiness by any stretch of the imagination. It's to a heroic mode of being that involves taking responsibility for the full catastrophe. And that in that adoption of that adventurous mode of being, there's a deep meaning to be found. Right? A meaning maybe that transcends just you, that involves your family and that involves your community and maybe even the destiny of humanity itself. But there's nothing about that that's secure or easy and very little that has to do with happiness. The the idea that your problems should be solved for you, let's say, and that it's unfair that you have them, well, it, it, it's attractive in that there's nothing for you to do except complain, but, but it's horrifying in that there's nothing for you to do except complain. The difficulty is actually, the funny thing is, is the difficulty is actually the destiny and it is insanely difficult, but maybe you're insanely up to the task. You know, and, and I would also say, there is evidence for this, you know. In, in the clinical literature, we know that one of the main strategies that you can use to help people cure themselves is for them to grapple with what they're terrified by grapple with what they're terrified so badly that they're avoiding and to learn to confront it in, in pieces, in stages, in manageable stages not too much, you know, because you can hurt yourself 
but not too little because then it's, it's pointless. And it works. It makes people not less vulnerable but more courageous and stronger.